Welcome everyone to a new Eurosci Network public discussion. Today we will de be dealing with a very hot topic, which is the EU budget, the pandemic relief and the Hungarian-Polish veto to the new budget for the next uh, uh, seven years and a budget that comes now in a very critical moment uh, and that aims to help the recovery of the pandemic. And we have today with us a very special guest who is a prominent member of the uh, Eurosci network. His name is Giacomo Benedetto from Royal Holloway University of London. Welcome, Giacomo. Hello. Hello. Okay, Giacomo. So Giacomo Benedetto is an expert on the EU budget politics. He holds a Jean Monnet chair uh, in European politics at Royal Holloway University of London, and he has been one of the founding members of the Eurosci network. And uh, we would like to know a little bit more if you could tell us an introduction about the EU budget before we uh, go into the more detailed questions related to the current negotiations and, and, and vetoes. Well, <clears throat> The, the budget in normal times, or the, the, the rules about the budget and, and what the budget does, uh, are done in kind of normal times when there isn't a crisis like the pandemic. And um, at the beginning of this year, to Europe, uh, and uh, which presented uh, big economic challenges. And, and of course, we don't know how serious the crisis will be over the winter, which is just going to be beginning now over the next four, four or five months. So uh, we can expect possible further economic crisis and cost. So the challenge that was in front of policymakers uh, was, of course, the normal uh, questions of the budget, because the budget uh, assists farmers, it assists scientists, it's, it's, it assists the development of uh, the poorer regions of Europe to help them integrate economically within the, the wider Europe. And the budget um, has now been called upon in some way to assist with the financial cost of dealing with the crisis of COVID. Um, both healthcare costs uh, and, of course, uh, economic recovery costs. Because even if COVID had finished this summer and it had only been something that had lasted two or three months, the uh, economic cost just for those two or three months in Italy and Spain was uh, extremely high. So uh, really to sum up, we have the, the standard instruments of the, of the EU budget, which have always been there. And now we have the COVID crisis. And there's the question of whether you can use the budget a larger budget uh, in order to um, to cover the challenge of COVID. So what I'll just say now is current budget works before COVID became something significant. The, uh, the budget, of course, uh, goes back to the 1960s when it was subsidizing for the most part um, agricultural incomes um, for farmers in France. The context of why so much money for agriculture came from the European community, as it then was, has to do with solving the challenge of food shortages in Western Europe after World War II. And so the budget was designed initially to provide assistance to farmers in order to encourage them to overproduce. By overproducing, uh, you would be certain that there would be enough food. You'd avoid the situation that farmers underproduce, which had been the problem before. So the budget was set up for very particular historical reasons and continued uh, along that path. Uh, it adapted. Um, it began also to fund regional development after the 1970s. Uh, and then during the 1980s and the 1990s, there was the single market program, 
and a lot more investment. Relatively speaking, the amount of money given over for agriculture was reduced. And so the budget is historically rooted, but it's also adapted over time. We should say that it's only 1% of GDP, which is equivalent to around 2% of all public spending. Um, and uh, its supporters always argue that it's focused on uh, uh, investment and growth. Um, it, sometimes it's difficult to sustain that when we're thinking of uh, the kinds of uh, financing that is allowed for the agricultural sector. But, but that has reduced. The proportion and the total amounts allocated for agriculture have been reduced over so the years. Let me, let me intervene now. So you're saying that the, the EU budget is more, more or less 1% uh, of uh, national income in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. The, and total, uh, the, the total every total year is about 100 at the moment, 160 billion, billion euro. euro. And now, uh, if it's 100% now in the current uh, crisis, the current situation, this uh, cap has been raised, it, it, it has been exceeded, this uh, 1%? Um, uh, no, um, the... Uh, the what has happened uh, this year is so within the budget there's a little bit of flexibility and there are some reserves to spend on emergency um, problems and this is a, 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 and all of those reserves for this year have now been used. The, you need to have a new agreement to push things forward for next year. Now, but the, the next agreement, the, the, this thing they talk about, uh, 750 billion, these are temporary and additional, right? They go on yeah, top yeah, of, come, of the cap. I'll come to those in a moment. Um, so uh, just very quickly to explain about the existing budget, there are, there are three or four levels to it, and I'll just explain very quickly what those are. So first of all, there's the financing level, which is about where, where the money comes from. And that's one agreement. And that's permanent unless somebody decides to change it later on. So that's not going to expire. And the financing, uh, most of the financing comes from uh, contributions made by each country on the basis of its size of its GDP. Uh, there's some financing that comes from value-added tax and from uh, tariffs. So when goods are imported into Europe from outside, the, the tax that's paid at ports, uh, most of that flows to the EU. So that's where the money comes from. Um, then every seven years, there's something called the multi-annual financial framework, which is usually known as the long-term budget. It's for seven years. And that sets... Uh, Mac, a sort of uh, a, a maximum amount for spending uh, on programs over the whole seven years. And that, unfortunately, for users and policymakers, is expiring at the end of this year. It, the current one runs from 2014 until the end of 2020, which is, which is uh, doubly unfortunate cons considering the, the, the needs to approve a new one. So, in normal times, a new a new package for the next seven years would have been approved to start on January the 1st. Then, uh, once you've got that seven-year program agreed for, for overall spending, you, you then do two other things. You have programs for individual policies. So, you know, Diego Varela and I have been financed by Erasmus+. Plus, Erasmus+. Plus, is one of the programs, just to give one example. And for Erasmus Plus to take effect next year, a new regulation to set its rules and put it into effect would also need to be applied. And that applies to all of the other expenditure programs, uh, including for regional development. Um, and then also you have the annual budgets because the, the formal budget is approved every year. And that that it, for the year 2021, we have the annual budget at the moment being delayed. So we have a situation where the multi-annual, the seven-year program, has not been agreed. The uh, uh, the all the programs such as for Erasmus Plus are waiting to be ratified, and the annual budget just for the year 2021 
uh, is still waiting also for approval. And what you will have heard is that uh, uh, two or three days ago, Hungary and Poland blocked agreements on this big package. And that's where I can now say something about the 750 billion, which Diego asked about. But before I do that, I just wondered if Diego wanted me to clarify anything about what I've explained already. Well, the, you said that the budget was uh, just one percent of of uh, of GDP or 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 or, or income of the uh, the European Union, approximately, right? Yeah, a little yeah. bit more than one percent. A little bit more than one percent now. now. Um, um, they. they Tend, tend to adopt, to adopt it at the beginning, the beginning of the seven-year seven period, period on the basis of size of GDP, and then the amount that they've adopted is frozen. So, if and how, how, how does this number relate to other government budgets? Well, well every, every national system is different one from another. Um, the seven-year uh, figure. So let, let me explain. Um, in the last agreement was made in 2013 uh, on the basis of the economic statistics from 2011, so from two years earlier. And in 2011, uh, one percent of GDP for seven years was calculated as being 960 billion euro. So that top amount of 960 billion euro was adopted. And then after that, for the next seven years, it's not the 1% of GDP that is remembered, it is the 960 billion. And for everything during that period, which is not spent every year, they have what's called a 2% inflator. So if the budget last year were 160 billion, this year it could increase by 2% compared to last year. Um, one related question. So the budget overall seems to be small. Let's say 1%, I, I believe the national governments spend around 40% of GDP. If this is just 1%, 40 times uh, smaller. In but the Western, Western half, half, in the, the older member, member states, states the Western, Western half, half of Europe, it's 45, uh, 46 on average. So, but my question is that I have read now uh, that in some particular countries of the EU, the EU budget represents much more proportionately in countries such as Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Why is that? It represents maybe 3% of GDP what they receive from the budget. How is it possible the budget represents 1% overall, but they receive 3%? So, so they contribute 1%, but to take the example of Bulgaria and Germany, Germany contributes 1% and Bulgaria contributes 1%. But first of all, Bulgaria, or rather Germany, is much larger in terms of a country, in terms of the number of people, and in terms of its GDP per capita, which is the average level of wealth, the size of the economy divided by the number of people. But uh, everyone pays 1%. Then, the, at least in theory, the expenditure is calculated differently. And uh, we know that Bulgaria is a very significant beneficiary from regional development um, and uh, other programs also, um, agriculture notably. So, um, as one of the less uh, rich member states, Bulgaria receives a lot of expenditure. I see. And does this expenditure come with strings attached? Yes. yes. Um, so 
even at its most generous level, the expenditure requires co-financing by the uh, by somebody. The the partner could be the local government, or it could be the national government of the country, or it could be the private sector. So a proportion of all funding has to be matched. Uh, however, let's say that there is a program that would be assisting with the construction of new roads in Bulgaria. Uh, I don't know if such a program has been put into into plan. I, it's very likely that such a program exists, but this is just a fictional example. Um, if 25% of the costs have to be met by a, a partner, not the EU itself, it could be the Bulgarian government, it could be the local government, the, the municipality in Bulgaria, uh, or it could be the private sector. For example, uh, if it were uh, a highway on which tolls were charged, which could generate a profit in the long term, then maybe it could be private investors who contribute the 25% that Bulgaria would need to put into the uh, finding, funding. So the funding does not have to be from the public sector in, in the country concerned. Uh, the other way to uh, provide the funding locally uh, is rather than directly with cash, you can use uh, a number of uh, months or years of the time of public employees uh, and say that that is your co-financing. So there are ways uh, to produce it. So it, it might cost, if it costs 20,000 euro to employ uh, a public official uh, per year and uh, a program lasts for five years, uh, you can, and, and if, you, if you use that public official to work full time on the EU program for five years, then you have 100,000 euro of local co-financing based on the time of a particular public official. Of course, they would then need to produce paperwork to prove that the time of the public official was being used for that particular purpose. So there is also so, this so you, you have now discussed about co-financing. Yeah. yeah. Co-funding co by by domestic uh, authorities. And this is a very important principle of the EU budget, I believe. But I was when I asked about strings attached, I was asking more about conditionality in the sense of the current row with Hungary that they are trying to uh, attach the, these uh, grants to the respect of the rule of law and other principles and make them uh, make the grants conditional on meeting those principles. What could you tell us about that? Well, that is um, a separate piece of law from the approval of the budget at the moment. So recently, a, a regulation was passed using co-decision or the ordinary legislative procedure, uh, which says that if a member state does not uphold the rule of law, uh, then uh, expenditure from the EU budget uh, in that member state can be reduced. And it gives the EU the power to do that. And that was passed as a new rule by a majority in the Council and by the European Parliament. And because it was passed by a majority, it meant that although Poland and Hungary voted against it, they were defeated. So now Hungary and Poland have said that unless that measure is reversed, they will block uh, this new agreement on the budget. And I, can, I, can it can it uh, formally be reversed with a new with a new regulation passed by a qualified majority? Yes, but on the other side, now that it's in place, there'll certainly be a minority of countries who are large enough to block uh, such a reversal. So, so this would be an example of the joint decision trap that in the EU. Uh, once you approve something, then it's very difficult to undo it, right? Yes. Well, uh, 
Eurosceptics, and perhaps that would include Mr. Orban, um, often defend the veto. So the, when we talk about the, the veto, we talk about a system where something to be approved needs unanimous decision. So all, all 27 of the governments to say yes. But the joint decision trap there is even, even worse because, yes, if you do get something agreed by all 27 and then later on one of them regrets it, um, you can't change it unless or reverse it unless, again, all 27 have said yes. So um, they're stuck in this position now of the 27 who are um, uh, the, 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 the majority in general of uh, at least 20, 22 countries would be needed to change this. So what I want to do is just briefly explain about the 750 billion. Um, we have the 1% GDP, or it would be probably 1.1% of GDP, which would be the multi-annual program which normally would have been approved, you know, as it has been in the past, okay, there's a negotiation, and then the governments decide to adopt it, and it's in place. Um, and if it's not agreed before the end of this year, the existing programme can roll over into next year. And some of the programmes within it, such as Erasmus+, Plus, could be extended if there is a qualified majority. So even if Poland and Hungary try to block this, you can extend existing programs into next year. And, and you can do that with a qualified majority. What cannot be changed, unless everybody agrees, uh, is the first of those um, levels that I talked about, which is the financing, how the financing of the budget is achieved. Because to, to change the rules about how, how you raise money from it, perhaps you could introduce new taxes or something like that, um, that needs unanimity of all the member states. And it needs to be passed through their national parliaments. So the, uh, the problem that those who want this big fund have is how you will finance it if Poland and Hungary are blocking an agreement because they want to get the other measure, the one that penalises them on rule of law, reversed. So the 750 billion is a separate fund from the EU budget. Um, the um, design of it is very uh, novel. It's really quite exciting. Uh, just because it is so novel, because there's not been anything like it in the EU before. Uh, what would happen is that uh, it would run for uh, four full years. Uh, the money, the 750 billion, would be raised on the financial markets with investors buying bonds. Uh, the uh, bonds would then be repaid using the EU budget over the course of for, of uh, 30 years. Yeah, the 30 year repayment until 2058, with repayments not beginning until 2028. So there would be what they call a repayment holiday for seven years. So is this the first time that the, the EU will go into debt? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the so the the 750 billion is generated from bond investors the repayment uh, begins uh, after 7 years and lasts for 30 years and then the 750 billion will be used only for 4 years until the end of 2024 a lot of it going for cohesion type expenditure as well as healthcare and scientific research, and then longer term investment. And 300, of the 750, 390 would be expenditure, and 300, uh, um, and the remainder, um, I'm trying to do my mathematics. Um, would be uh, loans. 
Um, so I, I get the point. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so then, let me so let me summarize. Seven hundred and fifty billion, out out of which uh, three hundred and ninety billion are real spending, and the 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 remainder is uh, uh, in the form of loans or or something like that. Yes. 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 And so, and so uh, if, if the Italian government would take out some billions as loans. Uh, they would repay, and then in turn, the EU would repay the uh, the bondholders. My, I just, uh, you know, what happens to me, uh, Giacomo? I'm not very good at mathematics. Probably many people watching us are not very good at mathematics. And uh, when we deal with these quantities, sometimes when I, 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 I buy a car. And it's thousands of euros, or maybe I buy a home and it's hundreds of thousands. But these amounts, like billions, I I cannot understand those amounts. I, how how much is this per capita? I I, I wonder that, and I th I thought I made the calculation in 750 billion for 446 million inhabitants in the EU. It makes 1600 euros per person. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's not that much in four years. That's like four hundred euros per well, year. Most, well, you have to remember, most people probably wouldn't get any of that amount, and it, it, the the it's particular investment. And so originally, this idea of this big grant was that it would be twice as much, one and a half billion, and. Uh, that it would be entirely expenditure. It wouldn't be. It would be borrowed, but it the the uh, then it would be spent. It wouldn't be loaned to particular countries as well. So at the moment, slightly less than half of it will be loans, and and slightly more than half will be spending. The old, the original idea was it was going to be twice as much, and it would all be expenditure. And that was an idea that came from Nadia Calvino. It's this, there's a paper called known as the Spanish non-paper, which is very short, um, and, and I can share that with you if you're interested. So, you mean <laughs> that this this agreement was supposed to be in practice four times bigger, because it was reduced to half, and of that half, it was the amount of spending was reduced to half. Because the other half will have to be repaid by national governments, right? Yeah. yeah. So I wonder how, why so much fuss about this thing? This is so critical. You know, we are, indeed we are living a very uh, serious crisis with this pandemic, and many people are out of jobs for months. There are lockdowns, and uh, the the economic cost of that of people being out of work for so long is is huge and how the european union makes so much fuss about just let's say 200 euros per year in spending for four years per person is that justified so it's um what has happened in uh in policy making is that the the budget uh, is resisted because it allows the European Union to be something more than just a free trade area, and so those who are eurosceptic, of course, it, it's money. So clearly, some people prefer that yeah, there is no money that they have to contribute, uh, even if the amount is small. Uh, but apart from that, it's not only money. It allows the the EU to be something more than just uh, something for economic integration. It is it is allows the EU to redistribute or to invest. Or in this case, if this fund were approved and it really worked, uh, then there would be a demand for more funds like it and more power and more legitimacy and perhaps even more popularity for the EU if that the use of those funds was successful. What will happen with the 750 if it is used is, is that, of course, we're facing now the second crisis this winter. I think there'll be a demand for, an, for a doubling of it 
right up to one and a half billion, one and a half trillion, uh, and it becomes something permanent. So, about the seven hundred and fifty billion borrowed on the financial markets. The question then is how the money is repaid, and the, where and where the Polish and the Hungarian governments had some power is, as I was saying, on the financing side. It required that the amount of financing for the EU budget increase from 1% to 2% of GDP. And that extra 1% is to finance the repayments of the 750 billion rather than new expenditure. Um, and then my, my question and then, and then, now and related question to this. Is that, well, what, what, what was also the question is that, is that, is that, that 700 that, that, that financing wouldn't be coming only from countries' GDP. It would be coming also from potentially from new taxes on the digital sector, on coal and carbon use, which, of course, are marked for the Polish government is very unpopular because Poland depends very heavily on coal. Um, and uh, on uh, Europe-wide corporations. So there would be a variety of potential sources of new tax, rather than it being financed purely through uh, contribution from each government's national treasury, which had been the case until now. So using tax more or less directly. My question um, was precisely related to this. It was about the... the sources of funding and in particular this new so-called google tax and my question is if this has been a plan for some time and maybe a possible source of funding for for the increase in the eu budget my my question is after the results of the american election and the fact that the new president joe biden has been elected with the support of big tech companies do you think the US will allow the EU to introduce a Google tax? Well, they'll fight it. So we know that um, 15 or more years ago, uh, there was um, a competition probe by the European Commission, which sought to regulate not only European corporations, but global corporations that operate in Europe. And Google and Microsoft were fined um, uh, for breaches of competition rules, even though they were not registered in the EU. And it was about uh, monopolizing advertising. In the case of Microsoft, it was about if you used Windows, uh, um, that, that Windows would include certain packages that would effectively prevent um, a consumer from choosing rival products. Uh, I mean, I, I don't understand the full technical detail, but uh, the European authorities deem that to be anti-competitive, to, to, to be a cartel, which is illegal. Even though Google or Microsoft are not registered in Europe, they operate, they operate globally, and they started to find Microsoft. And this outraged not only Microsoft, but also the American politicians. And um, so um, that can be a source, a source of disagreement with the United States. But we'd see what would happen. I see. You, you mentioned other sources of funding, uh, environmental taxes for coal, for instance. But I, I heard now that in the UK, maybe you can tell us about this, many people are moving to uh, the use of uh, electric cars and they are buying uh, less diesel fuel and less uh, uh, petrol for their cars and and the government is thinking about introducing a uh, paper use in roads like uh, uh, to introduce like uh, uh, a tax that you would pay per the, in kilometers that you drive per year have you heard about that? Can you elaborate a little bit? No, I'm not informed about it. There is some kind of noise in the media um, about this, but um, I'll, I'm, I'm afraid that I shortly have to go to another appointment. But what I, what I just want to explain is what happens now that Hungary and Poland have prevented this agreement. 
it's possible to um, use a mechanism called enhanced cooperation, uh, which allows when when there isn't agreement for new European integration to be pursued by a group of at least nine countries. Um, 25 countries out of the 27 could ask for this uh, package to be financed and managed separately from the EU budget and for the European Commission to make a proposal. Um, the European Parliament would be involved in accepting that agreement as well. And it would be to establish what would be effectively a parallel budget for 25 member countries that could still be administered by the European Commission. And this would be a way uh, to uh, circumvent the position of Hungary and Poland. And Poland, Poland in particular has, uh, I think, a real problem because COVID-19 infection rates in Poland are now very high. So Poland, you know, will be needing this investment. Um, and it's a question of, you know, what do they want more? You know, in, in terms of cost and benefit, uh, would they like the type of investment that Italy or Spain are expecting to receive to manage their own COVID crisis in Poland? Or do they really want to protect themselves from these rule of law obligations? Now, the rule of law obligations are quite broad. They, the, it's aimed at dealing with corruption, but it's also aimed at dealing with a society or, or, or a political system where there is less political freedom. And it's said that the governments in Poland and Hungary um, have not respected uh, democracy and freedom of speech. Um, I'm not going to comment about Hungarian and Polish politics uh, or what their governments have done. But uh, that is the argument that is coming from those who wanted this rule of law obligation. The, certainly the governments of Poland and Hungary were intended as targets of those rules. Um, uh, and I'm not going to offer a view about whether that was the correct um, decision to make. I see. So, so this would be the so-called two-speed Europe. Well, it's happened a lot before, um, starting with the euro, which the UK, Denmark, and Sweden didn't join. So, more or less, you say that now there's like a standoff between the the leadership of the EU and these countries, uh, uh, Hungary and Poland. Who will win in the end? Well, the so I think the EU side is probably getting legal advice and trying to decide what to do. So it seems to me there are three. There are three. If you want to approve this fund, the seven hundred and fifty billion, as well as the new MFF, there are three alternatives. One is to uh, to relent on action against Poland and Hungary. Um, one is to um, uh, one is, but that's not going to be politically acceptable within uh, other member states, particularly because you would now need to reverse this regulation that has already been passed. One is to pursue what's called enhanced cooperation, where twenty-five countries could try to establish a fund outside the EU budget that would be administered by the Commission. And the third is to create something like the European Stability Mechanism with a separate treaty, financed separately, a completely different organisation from the EU that would be run by 25 governments uh, in the way that the ESM is run by governments from the Euro area. Uh, and would use a similar method as the ESM, obviously not for dealing with the euro crisis, but for dealing with the COVID crisis and making loans. But that third option is something that the government in Germany particularly wants to avoid. Uh, they don't want to have any more repetitions of that experience because the question of the ESM made them very unpopular in Spain, Italy and Greece. 
I see. So this will be an interesting thing. When, when do you think it will be resolved? In December? Uh, well, the decision, I, I expect the decision about which which um, method to use will 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 come from uh, the governments very soon. The, the Italian Ital and the Spanish governments, um, for sure, will be uh, thinking very carefully about this, and they have very, um, uh, you know, they have actually very competent finance ministers. Uh, both of those two countries, uh, as as does Germany, and they will be thinking uh, and uh, trying to come up with a solution to this. Okay, Giacomo, I do not want to abuse your generosity. I thank you very, very much for having uh, been with us uh, today. Now we will continue uh, with our students at Alexandru Iancuza University of Yash in Romania by Zoom. If you, if you would like to join to say hello to them, you are welcome also. But I, I really thank you very much for being with us today. And I hope that uh, this new format that we are doing now for EuroSci Network uh, public discussions will, will be successful in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giacomo. Okay.